Okay, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Vlad, who's gonna be talking um, about the universal two parameter VOA of type W1 cube two, three cube four. Right. Yeah, thank you, Floor. Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and thank you everyone for uh, joining today. Uh, I'd like to report on some uh, um, recent progress uh, with the uh, on the project that I have with uh, Thomas and Andy on the construction of this beast. Um, so um, it has been making uh, it, it has been a, a a long time in the making. So uh, I'm happy to present some of the uh, oops uh, some of the new results. Okay, so let me motivate this. Uh, so. Uh, w uh, algebras uh, have generated uh, great interest uh, in the recent years uh, because they're uh, quite useful and appear in a lot of places in uh, math and physics. Um, and uh, some observations one can make on them is that uh, they, uh, these W algebras or their affine cosets, uh, they tend to fall into, uh, some of them fall into infinite families and uh, they share in a common uh, repeating generating type pattern. Uh, so some prominent examples include uh, these kinds of W algebras, where you have a strong generator and wait two, three, all the way up until n. And another uh, example would be where you have a strong generator in even weights. But of course, not every uh, such W algebra uh, or their affine cosets uh, would be of those uh, type two types. Of course, uh, many more things can happen. Uh, but also, um, so this is a conjectural process of Hamiltonian reduction in stages that uh, um, we believe uh, should hold in some generality, suggests that you can uh, decompose many of these uh, W algebras uh, as extensions of tensor products of certain building blocks. Um, so uh, I think it was originally uh, suggested in, in this thesis of uh, uh, Morgan uh, and then uh, uh, um, Naoki and um, Thibault uh, did some work on that. And also I should mention that Shigenori and Justine have uh, verified this in type A uh, uh, up until rank five. So th 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 there's some considerable evidence that that should be the case. Uh, now these uh, uh, examples, uh, um, these examples here, uh, they provide some, uh, but not all of such building blocks. Uh, and sort of what we uh, conjecture, what we, uh, belief is that uh, uh, the uh, algebras with uh, uh, these strong generating types, so where you have this pattern, uh, you have three fields in weight one, you have one field uh, in weight two, uh, strong generator, uh, three in weight three, four in, uh, one in weight four, and so forth, uh, they should provide uh, these remaining uh, blocks. And so somehow, once you understand these blocks, once you understand the atoms, perhaps this would help you understand the, 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 the great zoo of W algebras. All right, so let me remind you of what the W algebra is. So uh, let G be um, uh, a least super algebra, and it has an even part uh, G0 and an odd part G1. And you choose a nilpotent element uh, in the even part. Uh, then you, one can associate to this data a universal W algebra, uh, denoted by this W superscript K, uh, at the level K, which can be, a, which in general is a complex parameter. And this is obtained through a quantization of a drinfield sokolov reduction. Uh, what one then one can do is uh, complete F, uh, this nilpotent element to an SL2 triple. Uh, and actually, I, I thought I would say an interesting historical fact that didn't know. So it's, it's a, a Jacobson Morozov uh, theorem, but apparently, so like uh, Morozov did this in, in, in Soviet Union. And then Jacobson did it in America, and uh, sort of it, it's funny how you know math is universal. It doesn't matter if you're a world apart; you come up with the same good, good, good math. So anyway, you complete it to an SL2 triple, and then um, you can obtain the type of this W algebra by considering the SL2 uh, by considering the decomposition of G as this SL2 module. You can just read it off from that data. So here's some well-known examples. Um, so one of the uh, most famous, perhaps, is uh, uh, principal W algebras in type A, and they have this uh, uh, generating type here. Uh, you can do something similar in type C, and then you have this generating type, which is, uh, uh, has uh, strong generators of even weights. Uh, then, you, of course, you can choose other nilpotents. There's not, it's, 
principle isn't the only choice. Uh, if you choose a subregular, you have this generating type. Uh, another famous example is uh, uh, of minimal nilpotent. It has this generating type. And of course, you can always choose uh, choose zero as a nilpotent. Uh, and then it it's this simply recovers for you the affine uh, affine via way. Okay, so um, but that's of course not all. In general, there's a lot more nilpotents. And as rank goes up, you have a lot more choices. And somehow uh, uh, we don't understand uh, most of them. So there's like some, somehow we, we we like to, we have some understanding of like what happens in the top here, like what happens on the bottom, uh, but somehow what happens in between in general is is, is, is kind of subtle. So, uh, so there's a lot more work to do, but anyway, so, um, let me just uh, go straight into the uh, W infinity algebra. Uh, so this uh, has a long history. Uh, it has uh, originally been conjectured in 92 uh, and uh, uh, later in the, uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, so it's a, it's, it's a certain natural uh, algebra. Um, it's, uh, it, 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 it has this type that has strong generators in the way two, three, and so forth, all the way to infinity. Um, and it serves as a classifying objects for VOAs um, of this type. So remember, principal W algebras, for example, they fall into this category. Right. Uh, so then, uh, rather remarkably, uh, Andy was able to show that uh, it exists and it's well-defined, and it's uh, defined over a two, it's a, it's a two-parameter algebra. So, um, namely, he was able to establish the conjecture uh, that was like, first uh, uh, stated in 92. So somehow a lot of time has passed. So I think it was first actually proven in 2017, and this was 92, so that's 25 years or something. I cannot subtract numbers. So, but it was some, it was a long time, right? So I would like to maybe comment at some point, like what I think, why, why it took so, so long. There's a certain insight that one needs to have to prove this. All right, so um, then uh, there exists a, a, an n by n family of uh, finitely uh, strongly generated algebras that are in bijection with the truncation curves, uh, in the, which is certain relationships between the uh, central, the, the two parameters of this algebra, which are the central charge and some other parameter lambda. So if you have this special relationship, what you can do is you can um, impose this. Uh, you can quotient this uh, uh, this ring uh, by this uh, uh, curve, and uh, then uh, some. If, if it's a special curve, uh, you can then further quotient this um, universal object uh, to obtain a simple one-parameter algebra, and uh, they would have this strong generating type two, three, all the way to some n. Uh, these are very special curves. Generically, this doesn't happen. Think of it something like admissible levels for like affine algebras. Like they're special levels. Generically, nothing happens. Um, all right. So uh, also, uh, it's worth saying that this algebra featured prominently in uh, establishing type A triality, which was conjectured uh, by Gayoto and Rabchuk and uh, uh, proved by uh, Thomas and Andy uh, somewhat recently. And this is a, a nice picture. I just uh, like pictures and uh, you know, so it has colors. Uh, it's pretty. So what this represents is, uh, I should say, this is not uh, a C lambda plane. Uh, these curves are not in C and lambda. There is another reparameterization of this algebra. Um, and in this reparameterization, uh, it's nice that the triality is kind of manifest. It, it, you can see it because you see, for example, like each of these curves, uh, they they correspond to these um, uh, uh, truncation curves, and you see, for example, this orange one here. It's like it sort of occurs, uh, you know, multiple times. So you can see it, ha it, it has this symmetry where you can rotate it around, and you see there is some symmetry present to it, and that's sort of reflected in the triality. So uh, and then their intersection points are quite interesting as well. Like you see that they intersect. And that gives you some interesting isomorphisms between uh, certain algebras. OK. All right, so then uh, another example is an even spin algebra. So even spin algebra uh, uh, so was uh, proven to exist uh, by 
uh, Andy and uh, Shashank. Uh, and it has uh, this uh, generating type and it's a two parameter VOA. It, it also has a history, I suppose conjectured in physical literature, um, but uh, um, but now we know it's a, it's a theorem. Uh, we will denote it like this. So like with the superscript even, um, Eve, uh, and uh, it has the same property that it serves as a classifying object for vertex algebras of this uh, strong generating type. So they have field strong generators of even weights. And similarly, there is uh, one parameter quotients uh, that, 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 that correspond to, uh, in this case, four distinct families uh, of n by n tr truncation curves. Um, and uh, oh, and uh, also this uh, uh, even spin algebra um, also features prominently in this orthosymplectic triality. So this is an analog of this triality, but uh, for, uh, for, for the even spin algebra. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it's it's worth saying that there's many more uh, of these kinds of universal two-parameter uh, vertex algebras which are conjectured to exist. Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, there is a way, a uh, conjectural way, to take many uh, um, to take gluings of many copies of these uh, W infinity algebra and the even spin algebra, uh, and uh, extend them by some modules. And it should also give you another uh, universal two-parameter algebra that also has a similar feature that it classifies uh, many uh, uh, many algebras of a certain strong generating type. Um, but the these are not all. So uh, here's a enough. And we often encounter this question: What about other types? Uh, so. This spoils it a little bit, I'm sorry, but okay, so here you go. So consider uh, an embedding of GLN, uh, Lie algebra GLN inside of SLN plus one. Um, I kind of like this because it's a very simple uh, way to generate a lot of complexity. Like at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're thinking of one square in a bigger square. And somehow <laughs> this is able to generate these kind of complicated objects. So you take this embedding of Lie algebras that you have for free, you lift it to a VOA embedding, and then you can consider a cosab of one inside the other. And uh, these uh, uh, algebras arise as uh, one parameter quotients uh, of this W infinity algebra. So that's a theorem, that, that, that is something one can show. Uh, then you can do the same thing in type BD. So you take uh, an SON instead of SON plus one, the same story, uh, take a coset, but also you need to take an orbifold by Z2 and for technical invariant theory reasons, you want to do that. Um, and then once uh, once it's done, then you sh can show that uh, um, this coset will arise as a one parameter quotient of the W of, of this even spin algebra. And uh, so, okay, uh, you know how it's gonna go. So in type C, you do the same thing. You look at this embedding, uh, you look at the coset, and then using very similar arguments uh, as, uh, uh, um, as above, uh, you, 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 you can establish that uh, it has this stronger generating type, which is we're after. So it, it has the you know three fields by one, three fields of odd weight and one field of even weight. Uh, now I, I put dot, dot, dots here because the truncation is a little bit subtle. It's going to occur uh, in some quadratic uh, way. Like it, 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 the last field you will see, it will have quadratic dependence on N, uh, but, uh, but it, it it will be uh, a truncation. So it will have this type. And so therefore we are kind of motivated to um, try to uh, apply the same recipe uh, uh, as uh, uh, you know, we, uh, as uh, with other cases. So let's try to construct, maybe there is a universal object similarly as in these cases that would give rise to these as quotients, right? All right, so this is uh, uh, the setup here. So um, we will first postulate that this sp2 algebra, uh, it's going to have this infinite stronger generating type. And uh, it's going to have uh, uh, these three generators in odd weight, one generator in every even weight. And that's how we denote them. So the odd ones are going to be x, h, y, and the even ones are w's. Uh, then we assume that uh, the affine uh, 
SP2 or SL2. The reason we call it SP is because of these SP cosets. That's the way it naturally arises. That's the, that's the reason for name. Of course, it's the same thing as SL2, but SP2 it is. Um, and so, yeah, so in weight one, we have this SP2 and it has a level K. Uh, similarly, uh, so similarly, well, th th there's also a Virasoro uh, and it's going to be generated by field L. Uh, and uh, this property essentially amounts to saying that it's weakly generated in low weights, namely by the uh, weight one fields, weight two field, and weight four field. That's it. So uh, all these uh, uh, these fields weakly generate the whole thing. Uh, but I like to think of it as a, a like to call it the raising property. So this raising property it says that the, the first mode of the W four field will raise the field su field successively. So for example, it takes weight one fields to weight three fields, then it takes weight three fields to weight four fields, uh, so sorry, five fields and so forth. So it's gonna jump by two. And the same way with even weight fields. So, um, you know, weight, if you do w, w4 circle one, W4 gives you W6 and so forth indefinitely. This is actually important. So this uh, creates some pain, but also it, it, it's a very, uh, helpful assumption. I believe without this assumption, uh, one cannot prove that such a thing exists. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to say a few words later, if time permits. And the last thing we, we assume is that it's not degenerate. So, and that means that this uh, uh, this uh, field um, W4, um, uh, it uh, has a, its leading pole is not, not zero. So otherwise, uh, the simplicity, you, you would have issues with the simplicity of the algebra. We want it to be simple. All right, so this is the theorem. Uh, so we have that it this vertex algebra with these properties, it exists and uh, it's unique up to localization of the base ring. Uh, it's defined over this polynomial ring uh, in parameter C and K, where the parameters are C, the central charge and the level of the affine. Maybe I should also remark this is different from the W infinity and the even uh, spin story because there, there remember there were two parameters. One of them was the central charge, which which had already explanation. But then you had this lambda parameter, which was a strange guy. Like it occurred, it just sort of occurred as a structure constant in the OPE in 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 some OPE of a uh, um, low level field, and you just accepted it as as a thing. It's hard to interpret the meaning of it. It probably has it, but maybe society or civilization is not ready to understand it yet. Uh, but in this case, it has nice ready interpretation, right? The, just the central charge and the level. So that's that's nice. Um, and also it has a similar property that under some mild assumptions, which I'll say later, uh, this algebra classifies all algebras which have this generating type. Um, and this may not be necessarily minimal. There may be certain issues with the way the thing, with the way it truncates. Um, you may not have three weight, uh, three fields of odd weight. Sometimes one of them may go away. Maybe two of them can go away. But in either case, so it's going to have this uh, strong generating type, but perhaps it's not minimal. Perhaps you can kick out some fields. Okay. All right. So uh, I'd, I'd like to say something about the proof because I think it's kind of a uh, it, it's kind of interesting. So the minimal assumption one would really start to, would like to start with is uh, only of uh, the stronger generating type. Suppose you have the stronger generating type and that's it, and then just impose every possible Jacobi identity. Um, and that would be nice if you can do it, but unfortunately this is not uh, possible to do because uh, what you end up with is uh, an infinite system uh, of coupled quadratic equations. And we have hard time solving these big systems of equations. Somehow, if one is able to solve these systems of quadratic equations, one can see the face of God <laughs> in a certain sense, because many uh, set, many questions in math can be reduced to uh, solving a big system of quadratic equations, classifying Lie algebras, classifying like many things. You can express it as a big system of quadratic equations. And, you know, that would be nice that if 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 we, if we knew how, how to do it but we don't so we have to be clever we have to make assumptions rather um and so the following three ingredients are necessary for the proof to work first is the symmetry so um you have to make use of symmetry I'll, I'll, namely the sl2 symmetry that we have this sp2 symmetry um 
Then the raising property. So the fact that it's weakly generated by fields of low weight. And also you have to know, you have to have a model in mind ready. So you have to, you have to have knowledge of some quotients of this algebra. Okay. And then once you have these three properties, then uh, you, you can prove it exists. So let me show you how this works. So first the symmetry. So this is analogous to the Z2 automorphism of the W infinity algebra. So that was kind of, um, there wasn't much said about it, but it's kind of important to, to, to the construction. Um, so similarly here, uh, now Z2, uh, instead of Z2, uh, we have SL2C because we have this affine in weight one. Uh, we can take the Z remotes of, of, of those fields and they will integrate to an action of SL2C and it will act by automorphisms on, the, on this uh, vertex algebra. And because of it, uh, this imposes some severe constraints on the kinds of monomials that can arise in the OPEs of fields. And that's very useful for us uh, because you know, constraints are good. Okay, so uh, here's some color codings. Uh, I'd like to explain how the setup works. So let V lambda be an irreducible representation of SL2. Uh, and then um, we will uh, just remember these products uh, and also the colors, maybe that's the important thing. So the blue is the trivial, the red is the adjoint and the green is the five dimensional one. And they have these products. So if you tensor trivial with the trivial, you get trivial, then trivial with the adjoint, you get the adjoint, adjoint with an adjoint, you get trivial plus uh, adjoint plus the five dimensional representation. So that's how SL2 representations tensor together, decompose. All right, so now suppose, uh, so we're doing this uh, base case computation here. So we have to set up the most general uh, um, OPE uh, of any pair of fields which are compatible with this symmetry. All right, so here's an example of like H3 with H3. So we have those two fields. Uh, let's try to write down the most general thing we can possibly find. So let's look at the leading pole. Well, you know, you look at the leading pole, uh, um, it will, the, the the weight of it is zero. So the only thing you can find in weight zero is the vacuum. So it's going to be some multiple of vacuum, vacuum term. Okay, uh, then you look for, okay, let's look at the, uh, 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 so which one is this? This is a fifth order pole. So that will lend you in weight one. What are all the fields in weight one? Well, there is X, X, uh, there's X1, Y1, H1. Which one has the right Cartan weight? H1. So that's the only one you can find, possibly multiplied by some undetermined constant. Okay, and then like maybe let's look at this one. So that's a uh, uh, second order pole, right? So second order pole of H3 with itself. Uh, what what can you find there? Well, so so H is red, so that's adjoint. So you can only find things that transform as like trivial, adjoint, or a five dimensional one. So this is a five. Uh, uh, is that? That color coding is, is not correct. Oh, I should have seen it. I apologize. This color coding is not correct. This uh, this this term transforms as the uh, as the adjoint. So this should be uh, uh, this should be red. I I apologize. It's a mistake. Uh, I, I just I just know from experience. <laughs> okay. So so yeah. But okay. Imagine it's red. All right. So then, uh, in principle, un unless you assume the symmetry, you would have to give two structure constants for each of these terms, but you only need to give one to this combination. So that's why it's helpful, right? Uh, and also it's gonna be helpful uh, later on. So anyway, so that's so that's what you do. Uh, you just set up this uh, these uh, OPEs with undetermined constants, and then you impose a bunch of Jacobi identities, which I remind you here they are. So the RS, I'll use this notation, uh, RS Jacobi identities, uh, Jacobi identity for between three fields, that's what it looks like. And P is the parity function here. So uh, I guess the, our VOA is not a super VOA. So just this is one, you don't need it. Um, but that's what the Jacobi identity is. And we're gonna impose a bunch of them. So uh, first I'm just gonna set up some notation. So let D subscript uh, be the set of all OPEs uh, of among fields of total weight less than N. For example, H3, H3 OPE would be in D6 because six is three plus three. All right, so then similarly you define, uh, so let's let JN, uh, again, subscript N, uh, be the set of all Jacobi identities among fields of total weight less than N. So for example, uh, the Jacobi identity that involves fields like H3, 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 
would be in J9. Okay. Uh, now, also, I should mention in this base case computation, it is um, very helpful to choose a different set of stronger generators uh, because, uh, um, and namely those that are primary for the SL2. There is a way to correct the generators you have so, 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 so that they become primary. And then the structure constants are a lot easier. You kind of have to do this. Unless you do it, you get stuck. Uh, that was, yeah, at least I, I, I couldn't do it with the other set of generators. The computation is just too complicated. Okay. So, uh, all right. So I'm pleased to state this little theorem. It feels like nothing. Who cares? You impose some Jacobi identities, but, you know, it's funny how like a year turns, turns into a two lines, a uh, year of work, <laughs> but it's, a, it, it's, it's, in retrospect, one can do it quickly if one knows what one has to do. If you impose these J11 identities, then all the OPEs in D9 are fully expressed in terms of C and K. All right. So that's what happens. Uh, you already find these two parameters uh, quite early on. Quite early on. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. All right, here we go. So this is uh, uh, so do, don't worry about the details here. I just put it in for a complete list. Let's just look at the top piece here. So um, so this is a, a um, we only need to uh, make some assumptions um, on the the, the zero products uh, of two fields and and one products of two fields. So what we're doing here, uh, I I call this the ansatz, the OP ansatz. Uh, this is really informed by the induction process. So once you have the induction process, uh, that sort of informs you of like what kind of ansatz you should make. And the way you should think about it is the following. So in general, if you look at the OPE, say uh, this is the first product. So this is the second order pole of uh, field uh, W2I and W2J. In general, the right-hand side is going to be a mess. It's going to involve a lot of, uh, a lot of terms. Uh, but you choose to peel away only those terms uh, that, um, um, okay, you want to collect enough terms in this mess of terms uh, that, uh, um, that so, so you collect all the contributions to certain expressions that appear in the induction process. This is like epsilon delta. It's like, you give me an epsilon, you have to find the right delta in some. So you peel away only the terms you need. And turns out you only need very few terms here. So that's why I split it up like this. This is, you, you can think of it, this is the leading part, and this is the subleading part. This is not so, this is, uh, uh, that's the way to think about it. And this leading part has a structure constant associated to it because every monomial has a structure constant associated to it. And what we will do in the next two slides is, uh, determine the structure constants explicitly. And then with the knowledge of the structure constants, we will be able to determine the rest of these terms explicitly as well. Well, not, not, not explicitly, but show that uh, they can be determined. Okay. And you have to do something similar for every pair of fields because you have a lot of fields. But let's just focus on these, on these ones, W and W. All right. So I just wanted to give you an example. Here's a Jacobi identity. So you have uh, the between these uh, three fields. If you just evaluate it using this ansatz that I just talked about, uh, it, it will have three terms. Uh, so you get some kind of identity saying that if you add them up, you get zero. Um, and what are these three terms? So what is this guy? So this guy tells you some kind of a constraint on these structure constants, W. That's what it tells you, here it is, right? Um, then you have another term, which is this guy. And this guy tells you some kind of a linear relation amongst these remaining terms you chose to omit. And then you have this other last piece. So this is our R is for remaining. So this is whatever's left over. And turns out that in the induction process, you can think of it as inductively known. So it always has the form that it just can be assumed to be known. So it looks like a mess, but uh, it's known by induction. And so anyway, uh, so, First, we will impose these identities, then we will impose these identities, and it turns out that that will be sufficient uh, to produce this uh, algorithm that will recursively determine this OPE algebra from the base case. So here's the explicit formula for the structure constants. So it may look bad, but it's actually nice 
these are sort of like binomial coefficients, actually, if you sort of stare at them, I should say. So this is the rising Poch hammer symbol. That, that, that's what this notation means. Um, so this means that this is like five halves times five halves plus one times five halves plus two, all the way to I minus uh, I minus three. Okay. Um, so this is what they are. And it doesn't really matter their explicit form. It, the, all that matters is that, uh, uh, well, no, it's important. You have to know their explicit form because this, uh, uh, from this explicit form, uh, you determine linear relation among these unknown uh, uh, terms, these remaining terms that you chose to omit. All right, so uh, so once you have that, then uh, you can uh, set up the induction. So it looks daunting. We don't need to, like, you don't need to understand every little detail. Notation is horrible, but it's what it is just because you have to take care of a lot of cases. So um, um, I'll, I, I'll let these superscript n denote the set of all uh, uh, all OPEs of fields uh, whose total weight adds up to n exactly. And then I will decompose it into the set of all products, which are going to be art products. So uh, explicitly, and, and then you have to decompose it one more step. Don't worry about this. Here is just the definition. For example, let's just focus on EE. So EE is e even for even even. That's what this means. So um, and it's because you're doing even even weight field with an even weight field, the total weight is 2n and r. Uh, what does this mean? This means that you're looking at all products of this form. So uh, 2i, uh, w2i and w2n minus 2i for all i, um, you know, between these two numbers. Uh, and you're including all the higher products. Uh, so you have all the products s that are greater than r, including r. So you have to, define this this kind of thing and then you have to do it for every combination of fields that can happen so you have even with an even even with an odd and odd with an odd and that's what you do define it uh, and then you impose all these jacobi identities that's and because you know the structure constants explicitly it looks bad but it reduces it to a linear algebra problem it, it's really what's happening and uh, once you have enough of those linearly independent jacobi identities you obtain a recursive algorithm to determine uh, uh, to determine products of higher weight fields in terms of lower uh, lower weight fields. So in this case, this is how it this is how it goes. Um, so what did I say here? So for example, you want to determine. So in this case, uh, if you want to determine two n plus two are, I'm sorry, where you go? Here you go. You want to determine two n plus two arth product. So th these are the uh, fields, pairs of fields whose total conform weight adds up to 2n plus 2 arth products. They're determined by this data, which you assume to be inductively known. And see, the point here is that here's r plus 1, here's r plus 1, here's r. So you have made progress in this case because you want to get to r equal to 0 ultimately. Um, okay, and then, and, and that's that's basically how it goes. So maybe I don't want to spend too much more time on it. It's just confusing. Uh, and you have to really see the details to believe it. But OK, so this argument would show that there is at most two parameters. Um, uh, because we have uh, imposed some Jacobi identities. So our induction consists of just selecting some choice of Jacobi identities and imposing them. Free generation demands that they all hold. So how do we know that they all hold if we only impose some of them? In principle, those identities we did not impose, uh, they can eliminate some of these parameters, maybe one, maybe two. In fact, if you just count up how many Jacobi identities you have, you expect the whole thing to be just complex numbers. Like you expect the whole VOA to de degenerate because there's a lot of these identities. But that's not what happens. Otherwise, I wouldn't. <laughs> this wouldn't be a talk. <laughs> um, so because we know of some models of this algebra, because we know of some quotients, namely those uh, these uh, cosets of sp2ns inside of the bigger sp2 and 2n plus 2. Um, there must be at least two parameters. Why? Well, because first of all, uh, we know that the, we know that uh, these guys have a parameter k in them, but also um, it requires a little of an, a little argument, but you can argue that the, the parameter n, which is the rank, you can analytically continue it to a parameter. So in so there has to be at least these two parameters that reflect the k and this n. So there must be at least two. 
Now, uh, the, the last thing you need to know is that, uh, that there is no um, singular vector in any way. Well, if there was one, uh, then it would have to be in one of these call sets. But because you know that the generating type, because you know about generating type of this call, call sets, you can rule it out. So that cannot happen. And so from this, from knowledge of these quotients, you get to conclude that there is at least two parameters. And so there is at the most, at least, and you're done. So that's how that would establish it. And uh, maybe the perspective I'd like to take on this is that uh, the, the miracle is not that it's a two parameter algebra, but rather that, that it exists at all. Because there's a lot of fields and all those fields have to be compatible with each other. So they satisfy a lot of compatibility conditions. Generally, one does not expect, you know, for them, uh, for them all to hold, but they do. So that's uh, that that that's the proof, and then I can talk about the quotients. Uh, maybe I should take a sip of coffee. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so I'm just going to continue and say something about the quotients. So why would somebody else care about this? So maybe that's why, because it has these quotients. Uh, so recall that in the W infinity and the even uh, uh, even spin algebra, um, many quotients are affine cosets of certain families of hook type W uh, super algebras. Uh, so there's something similar uh, hap that, that, that happens here, uh, but there's some subtleties. So consider the uh, the following list of eight families uh, of Lie algebras, and we want them to have the following decomposition. So there's going to be some Lie subalgebra B, there will be some Lie subalgebra, well, SP2 will be a Lie subalgebra, and there'll be some Lie subalgebra A. Uh, and then what you want to do is uh, you want to, uh, uh, well, and, and then uh, this MAB will be some module for this Lie subalgebra, this the sum of these three Lie algebras. Uh, and you allow B to be the following uh, two kinds. So it can be either type C or type uh, type B. And then A can be uh, any one of the following algebras. So in total, you have eight possibilities for all the choices. All right, so then what you do is you consider a W algebra of this form where you take F to be the null, to be a null, the null potent that is principal in this B part, in this B, uh, uh, B sub algebra. So, okay, you can define such a, such a W algebra and then you consider it's uh, affine cosets, but, but here the coset is, uh, you take the coset by A, uh, you leave the SP2 behind. You have to leave it behind because you want the right generating type. You want to have uh, three fields in weight one. Okay, so, and then this guy, uh, this coset, uh, and possibly up to up to an orbifold, you may need to take a Z2 orbifold, um, is a quotient, is going to be a quotient of this uh, algebra, this SP2 algebra. And uh, there will be some truncation curve, which will realize this quotient. And uh, maybe, it's also worth saying that in this case, the truncation curve, because the parameters occur in low weights, it's just the central charge and the level K, the truncation curve is simply the statement that central charge equals, it's, it's, it's a formula for the central charge, which you know from the W algebra theory, you can compute the central charge of these W algebras. So like here, the truncation curves are just known manifestly, unlike in the other case of the, the W infinity and the even spin, where you had to actually compute what this lambda parameter is and how does it relate to the central charge? Okay, so that's that's that, that's kind of cool, um, and yeah. So now I want to give a few examples, uh, and also I I'll mention that the the structure of this module MAB is a little bit more complicated than in the in the W infinity and the um, even spin uh, algebra situation. So here's an example. Uh, so take G to be SO4N. So one can see that it has a subalgebra SP2N uh, uh, plus SP2. And then you can decompose this G as a module over the subalgebra. And you obtain this decomposition where this SP2N module, uh, where uh, this guy, uh, this module, it will occur as a, as a summoned um, 
of the uh, second exterior power of the ad, of the uh, standard module for of, of SP2M. So that's that's the definition of this uh, this module here. Um, and yeah, you can evaluate its dimension. Uh, and the dimension is going to be important to determine the generating type uh, of of of, uh, of this W algebra. So, well, before we define the W algebra, let's choose our null potent. Uh, you, so you choose an, the null potent uh, to be principal in SP2N here. Uh, and then uh, one can show that this W algebra is freely generated and it has uh, this form. So it is going to be a quotient uh, of this SP2 algebra. Um, and the way that you obtain this decomposition, you can see this de decomposition. Uh, if you look at the, um, if if you look at this piece uh, of the algebra, if, if if you look at the W algebra uh, SP2, um, mm, uh, okay, yeah, I. I just talked about this with Andy, and I forgot how this went exactly. Sorry, if if you allow me, I'm just uh, I'm gonna skip this for now, and then maybe we can come back to it in the questions. Um, I'm just uh, flooded with uh, endorphins, cannot think on the spot. So okay, so you one can convince oneself that it has this generating type. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so then you can do something similar for. Uh, uh, for, for this Lie, Lie algebra here, uh, you can see that it has uh, this subalgebra, and then do something similar. You can decompose this big. Uh, that's supposed to be SP, of course. Uh, so that's a typo. You can decompose this uh, big Lie algebra as a module over the subalgebra, and you obtain a similar decomposition. But now the exterior uh, product is replaced by a symmetric product. Vlad, I have a question. Sorry, are yeah. you taking A to be zero? Or am I That's right, something? absolutely. Ah, okay, yes. thank you, yes. thanks. In this case, I should have said this, yes. In this, in these, both of these examples, A is zero. Yes, yes. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then you choose F to be a uh, null potent in this P. This is just, I should have seen this typo. I. There's, yeah, so this is supposed, so, okay, SP, Two two n plus one, s o two n plus one, because that it's supposed to be this. At some point, I copied and pasted something and forgot to change things. That's what happened. Um, yeah, so you want uh, the null potent to be principal in s o two n plus one. So this is supposed to be s o two n plus one. Then, uh, using a similar argument that somehow I cannot uh, say right now, you can show that it has this generating type. So it is again going to be a quotient. So now comes an example of uh, where A is not zero. So now consider this, um, uh, this Lie algebra, and then you take F as uh, this uh, uh, null potent as, uh, as in this previous example here. So it's going to be null potent that's principal in this SP2N part. But now it's a bigger Lie algebra. There is plus two R here. Okay. Um, then uh, you can consider this W algebra. I forgot to say psi is the shifted level here. So psi would be the negative dual Coxeter number plus K, the usual level that, that we have. But I should have said this. I, I forgot to add this. Um, so this will have an affine sub VOA. It's going to have SP2 which uh, of course we have from that decomposition, but also it's going to have SO2R. So that that's this A subalgebra that uh, that we have freedom to choose. And the, the levels of these algebras are going to be related as follows. All right, so then this coset, you can take the coset of this um, SOR uh, algebra inside of this W algebra, Again, you take a Z2 orbifold for some technical invariant theory reasons. And uh, this object will be a coset of this SP2 algebra also. And uh, here I have uh, put in the truncation curve. Um, so this is just the formula for the central charge. It's easy, but also you can see that it's kind of nice. It has a nice factorization. Yeah, it's 
I like it. It looks pretty. Okay. So the way that we would like to regard these are as uh, these eight families of algebras. They're type C analogs of Gayata Rabjak Y algebras in types A and orthosymplectic type. Um, and similarly uh, to the, the other cases, the intersections of these truncation curves. So that's just one. There's seven more. The, their intersections uh, are going to be some nice rational numbers. And they give rise to interesting coincidences uh, among uh, different uh, um, different quotients of this algebra. But also, uh, there is no isomorphisms uh, of one parameter quotients of this algebra. So in triality story, that's what that's one of the ways one can one can parse what triality means is that there will be isomorphisms of uh, one parameter quotients of those W infinity and the W even spin algebras. In this case, it doesn't happen. All these curves, they're just distinct. They they look different. So it doesn't happen here. So there's no the same kind of triality uh, in this for, for this uh, algebra. And is it because K and C were uh, related in a much clearer way? Was it like there was no lambdas? Possibly. Parameter? Yeah, that's possible. I mean, it, it, it's sort of hard to say why math is turned out in such a way that there had to be no symmetry here. So uh, the way, possibly that's the reason, but I'm not sure. In principle, one can obtain these truncation curves or compute the central charges and look at these curves and maybe one can see a pattern. Oh, if you like, you know, if you replace uh, K by k plus r minus something, if you just like play around with it, you would recover a curve of another algebra. That could, that could That can happen, but it doesn't. So it's sort of hard to explain uh, why this happens, but it seems that it's some kind of, maybe future will uh, inform us why there's no trialities, why, 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 well, in this case, why there's no isomorphism between one parameter quotients. There's multiple ways to parse the meaning of triality. Uh, and that's one of the ways. Are there isomorphisms among one parameter quotients? And in this case, there is no. In another case, you can parse triality in a different way, where we think the answer is like should be yes. Uh, but maybe I'll just like uh, get to the last slide, and then uh, if people have follow up questions, we can discuss that. So in the in the cases of W infinity in the even spin algebra, um, it is conjectured that all one parameter quotients of those algebras arise exactly as uh, these gayoto rabchak Y algebras. So um, we don't expect to find any more one parameter quotients that are, um, uh, yeah, the, that they all arise as Gaiato Rabchak Y algebras. There we go. But in this case, uh, this is false because we have one more family of, of quotients. And that's because we have affine subalgebra uh, in, in weight one. We have this SP2, which we didn't have for the other objects. For, for the W infinity in the even spin. So consider uh, this conformal embedding uh, of, uh, so this is the simple, uh, so this is the, 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 the simple VOA of SP2N at level one. Um, this is at level N. Uh, so they will sit, uh, in fact, they will form a dual pair inside of a foreign fermions. Dual pair means that one is the commutant of the other and, and vice versa. So then uh, this allows one to consider a diagonal coset of this kind. Uh, and using uh, this statement about dual pairs, one can observe that it will contain uh, this SP2N, uh, simple SP2N at, at level N, where N is going to be some integer. Then using the invariant theory argument, one can show that it has this strong generating type, which is exactly uh, has the right matching. It matches the pattern of our algebra. Um, and so this way, uh, we can show that this algebra is a, is a one parameter quotient of this SP2 algebra. And the curve in this case is simply the statement that the level K is some natural number N. Okay, so this is something interesting. This is, it doesn't happen for the other uh, you know, for, 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 for the other W infinity in the even spin algebra. Okay, so, uh, all right, this is, this is, I can't believe this happened. Okay, I'm at 50 minutes, so yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, I have some references. I'm 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 happy to uh, answer any questions and uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Vlad. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions for Vlad, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I asked a few, so I'm gonna wait. But... Okay, I have another one then. Vlad, would you mind going to your last uh, slide? So you said, I didn't completely understand the statement here. You said that it's conjecture that all one parameter quotients arises diodo wrap check Y algebras for W infinity and W even. And you also mm -hmm. said that's not the case here. So if I understand correctly, this eight D algebras that you described would be the analogous thing of the Gaiota wrap check. That's right. List. Yeah. That's how you uh -huh. regard them. Yeah. Because they arise in a similar way. Uh, yeah. The the way so that... So how is the four free fermions a, a, an example that that's not the case here? I didn't understand that the, the end of the story there. Sorry. Yeah, so the reason that that's not the case, because uh, here the constraint, if you look at the truncation curve, that's the way maybe to see it in, in the cleanest way. The truncation curve expresses central charge as the function of level K, right? Uh, and uh, once you impose this relation, then um, you can take a simple quotient of this uh, this big sp2 algebra, and this will produce to you um, this uh, the these these truncations. In this case, uh, the truncation curve looks different, right? It doesn't express the central charge as a function of k. It just says the central charge here is the parameter that's left. And k is just fixed to be some integer. So in that sense, it doesn't belong to that family. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe there is a better explanation of this. So Andy and Thomas, feel free to, to, to you know, jump in and tell me to shut up. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Oh, let me stop. Maybe I'll stop the recording to see if people are more comfortable asking questions then. 